Hello and welcome to this video where I'm going to talk about process analytical technologies in the pharmaceutical industry. So I've done a previous video on quality by design, which is an inbuilt quality control process where you look at critical process uh, parameters and critical quality attributes. So in essence, process analytical technologies is about the tools that you need to achieve this quality by design. By design. And I will give a couple of practical examples of how sensors are used within PAT. Now, first of all, let me just define the concept. So when the FDA defined quality by design, also in 2004, they looked at process analytical technologies and they said it was a mechanism to design, analyze and control pharmaceutical manufacturing via measuring of critical process parameters and critical quality attributes of the product. Now, in the pharmaceutical industry, contrary to perhaps some other industries, it's a very dynamic and a complex nature of the products. Um, so because a lot is happening and because it's very versatile, this means that this PAT is definitely not straightforward. And the tools that we need in order to design and analyze these critical process uh, parameters and CQAs includes things like multivariate analysis, because often we're dealing with big data, so we need models to make sense of our data. We obviously need some biosensors to actually measure the data. Um, but what's also included in there is that you should strive towards continuous improvement of your process, better understanding of your process in order to get better uh, uh, quality of the products and better management. So it encompasses a whole range which is more than just sensors. But in this video, I will go into a bit more detail in a couple of sensors that are commonly used and what you can do with this. Now, the reason why a lot of these sensors are used because they have got to be fast. So imagine that if you want to control a process, you probably want to do this as fast as you can. Uh, very low cost, so these are routinely available in every laboratory. Very sensitive. And what's very important is that it's non-invasive, so you don't destroy your sample. The problem that you get with this, since you measure over a lot of different frequencies and you might only be interested in a couple of, uh, of frequencies or a couple of peaks in the whole of your spectrum, it means your data can be more complex than you, th than you think. We know that infrared is very good at identifying certain functional groups. What it's not so good at is quantification of this, because as I mentioned, these spectra are quite complex. So you'll probably be looking at models, uh, which I've described in another video, like principal component analysis or partial lead squares, in order to quantify the NAR response. The advantage of this technique is that it can measure a whole range of compounds. So we can look at this for glucose, ammonium, lactate, a lot of nutrients, uh, but even for biomass, we can have a look at this. And this NAR comes in handy because it supports, like, whereas most tools used to be offline, uh, where was, uh, you needed like a specialist laboratory to analyze things. Then it went to Atline, where you take something out of a bioreactor uh, and then uh, you measure it. But there's still like a, a somewhat time delay of like 10, 20 minutes. Think of something like gas chromatography. Um, whereas these tools you can use either inline or online. So really you get a very fast response, which is obviously better for controlling your system. Now, NAR you will often see combined with other tools, which I'll talk about later. So in reality, you probably have a couple of sensors that you'd be looking at. And especially Raman is quite complementary because it looks at uh, similar peaks, but can identify other compounds. And if you look at biomass, you might combine your results with something like optical density. Well, let's have a, a look at an example then of how this works. Now here, NIR is used for tablet processing, because I mentioned before, this is a non-destructive technique. And it's so fast um, that, and if you want to know more about it, you can have a look at this paper, you can even process around 70,000 tablets per hour. So that means it's very good for quality control. So you don't even just have to screen your compounds, you can really get through a lot of them very, very quickly. And in this case, they looked at the actual pharmaceutical ingredient within those tablets in order to quantify it. And that needs to be within a specific range in order to pass your quality control. Obviously, you would be able to apply NAR in your bioreactor as well. But here I'm just going to focus on the tablet processing. And later I'll talk about Raman and how you can use this online in your reactor. 
Now, a big problem with the tablets, and I think think of, for instance, like paracetamol or aspirin, uh, is that um, there can be like the composition might not be exactly uniform. So there might be a distribution of your active pharmaceutical ingredient within the tablet, which can lead to some problems if you're just sampling one specific area. Now, what you uh, can see also here, if you actually look at the spectrum, you will see that you see a whole range of different peaks. So there's also a bit of drift in the signal. So normally you're supposed to have a nice uh, straight line. And the first thing you probably want to look at is doing some background correction. Um, so there's a couple of ways of how you can do this, but something like, for instance, a SNV, which is a method uh, for background correction, would be the first you could apply in order to make sure that you don't see that kind of influence of that shift in that baseline. And that's probably got to do with the fact uh, that within uh, your tablet you have a lot of other compounds besides just the active pharmaceutical ingredients. So you have things like a coating, which might be titanium if it's white, you have excipients. Um, so there's many other things that can give a peak. And here you can nicely see that within the whole spectrum, there's only one main API peak. And most of the time I've got to say these compounds have got multiple peaks anyway. But there was one main peak they looked at in order to quantify the response. And as you can see, that's just a very small part of a big spectrum. And if we zoom into this, which you can see on the right, uh, there the different colors represent different concentrations. So you can see that there is some influence of the concentration on the height of the peak. But we would first need to apply some background correction. So in order to make sure that these peaks are not artificially elevated because of the presence of other compounds. And then we probably want to use something like principal component analysis, which is a more a visual way of representing what it would look like. Or if we wanted to quantify it, we could use PLS in order to uh, determine um, if we get a certain response, how that would correlate to the amount of API within a tablet. Now, there are lots of complications that you can get with this. Um, so usually, if you look at these papers in terms of model development, they would usually have uh, two techniques which they will compare against each other. Uh, and often one is a slightly more reliable, but an offline technique. So as I mentioned, offline is something that you have to take outside of the laboratory. It's very time consuming, but usually you get pretty reliable results. Now, what you could then see is that the bias, uh, so whether we could actually accurately determine uh, the amount of API, was pretty non-existent for the offline spectrum. But obviously that wouldn't directly uh, on the time and the place, imagine you're in a factory, determine whether these tablets are actually suitable and would uh, determine uh, quality control. If we started doing this inline, you could see that the bias significantly increased. Now, what they showed within this particular paper is that the pre-processing is really critical for the calibration. So if you look at inline spectra, uh, there's a lot more influence of other components that come into play. So the influence of the pre-processing is much more important. And the other thing which I mentioned is that the distribution of uh, the active uh, pharmaceutical ingredient in these tablets is often not uniform. So having multiple probes can really improve your result and is really critical to the success of this. Now usually the problem with sensors is that you can have some drift occurring over time. So slowly you can artificially see that kind of there's a gentle slope within your response and your signal starts to go off course. So obviously then you wouldn't be able to predict the active pharmaceutical ingredient anymore. Now that's why if we wanted to do this and you imagine a system where you have lots of tablets going through uh, very quickly in our sample to see whether they pass quality control. If not, you would eject the tablets. Um, if it's fine, then they can go ahead and they can go for packaging, etc. Um, so it's very important that you don't just use these sensors, but that you also have some feedback loops in place to detect when things are going off course. Now, another example which shares a lot of similarities to, to NIR, but is based on a different scattering principle, is Raman spectroscopy. Now, again, this is very fast and this is getting cheaper. So I would say it's not comparable to the price of NIR, uh, but there are novel handheld devices which are on the market. Uh, and if you would, for instance, go for airport control, when they check uh, for explosive substances, when they kind of look at uh, when it swipes something across your clothes, that's a Raman machine. 
So in essence, this technique is becoming more and more popular, so it's being more widely used. And the advantage of this is that it's complementary to NIR. So there are certain peaks that you can't detect uh, with infrared spectroscopy. Because infrared spectroscopy looks at vibrations, so you have, you have vibrations that cancel each other out if they go like in, in similar directions. So what you get in, for instance, uh, molecules like oxygen and nitrogen, uh, where there's no difference between two oxygen molecules, um, they can't detect this. Um, so Raman is very good at, at uh, identifying then the other peaks that NAR can't. Uh, so things like carbon-carbon bonds and graphene you can easily detect with Raman, but also things like water. So the OH peak of water really dominates in NAR spectrum, which can really be a problem if we want to look online in the reactor. And Raman is therefore much better capable of dealing with systems which are in water. Now, Raman similarly to NIR can be used to determine API content, uh, but it's slightly more expensive, which is why it's not uh, as routinely used as NIR. And it's very important because it can monitor reactions and it can be used for control of certain processes. So here you can see, for instance, that they looked at uh, certain compounds over time. Um, and they had a PLS model to predict what would go hap what would happen. So they could check uh, how much of the product was formed over time, how much of the substrate was used. So you can actually check whether your reaction is uh, running according to place uh, using something like Raman, which you can do within the bioreactor. Now, I said before that I wanted to cover a couple of different sensors and how they can be used within a PAT framework in order to control your process. Now, that's why I will also look at high-performance liquid chromatography, or HPLC, and I will show that even though traditionally this is somewhat like a slower technique compared to some of the spectroscopy techniques, it can be a very useful tool uh, in order uh, to control the quality and the impurities that you have within your product. So in this uh, study, they compared online HPLC uh, with offline HPLC. And pooling, which is where you look at the recovery of certain substances within uh, chromatography, usually at 280 nanometers, there are a lot of compounds that you can detect. So have a look at the spectra and spectra in A. You can see that these peaks are very nicely separated. So you could see like um, that the main product, the dimer and the aggregate, all these peaks appear at a different place. However, in reality, uh, it's never quite as simple as that. And you can have like a peak, uh, if you don't uh, take a lot of time to separate this, you have a very broad peak where you can see within that peak where the different fractions lie. And obviously when we look at pharmaceutical products, it's very important that our product is as pure as possible. So if you wanted to look at this in this paper, they compared different options and they compared how it would impact on the product quality, uh, but also on the financial aspect. So the first option is pooling uh, a recovery 280 nanometers where we have fractions that will contain your product, but also impurities. And the question is how bad these impurities are for your product quality. What you can do, and this is a much slower process. Now, if we do offline analysis, it means that we collect all of the fractions separately we take it to a different laboratory, and there we analyze these fractions to determine what fractions actually contain your product. Very reliable option, but a very slow process. And you will see in the next slide how all of these options compare. Now, the first option, which is more in line with the PAT framework, is that we don't just do the pooling at one uh, specific uh, wavelength, as you see now before. So HPLC is, is often combined with uv vis spectroscopy, where the HPLC is used to separate out the compounds, and you have a uv vis detector, but you can have different detectors as well. Uh, we could do pooling based on real-time HPLC analysis. So we wouldn't just look at the peak, we would also try to separate that in different fractions. And in order to achieve this, we need to do the analysis much faster than you would normally do with a normal HPLC. So in this slide, you can see a brief summary of the three different methods. So the first method where we do pooling at an absorbance of 280 nanometers is the most common approach, very easy to implement, and is probably most efficient in terms of time. Now, the problem that you have with this approach 
is that uh, at 280 nanometers, you can't discriminate between the product and other related products, which might be impurities. So as a result, you might have variable process quality, uh, and that is not aligned with this PAT framework. With the second approach, where we do the offline analysis uh, with HPLC, obviously you can very, very well control the, the, the purity of your product. However, this needs a lot more time and resources, and it's not really in line with like an inbuilt quality control. Therefore, the third approach in principle, so where we have the column uh, pooling based on real-time HPLC analysis, would be the approach you would go for from a PAT perspective. So at the moment, this is not so commonly in implemented, uh, but what you would do is that you, you would overall, if you would have a good process like this, you would really streamline the process and it would be more efficient in terms of resources. And you should be able to, in real time, control the product quality. So it should be more efficient. However, there's quite a, a lot of problems around the analytical method to it and you, you add operational complexity. So the key thing is that you would need to adapt your analytical method, so it will need to go a lot faster, uh, and therefore your analysis might not be as robust as you think. However, if you get a better understanding of these separation processes and a better understanding of what impurities you might have within your product, you see more and more of a drive towards going to option C. Now here's a short summary then on process analytical technologies and hopefully you understand now how this goes hand in hand with quality by design uh, where we have an inbuilt quality control within the bioreactor. Now often, well I, I obviously work on sensors, but PET is much more than sensors and you will have seen now that this also comprises modeling, multivariate analysis and management control to continuously improve your understanding of the process and thereby the overall quality of your product, which is especially important in the pharmaceutical industry. Inline monitoring, there's definitely a move from offline going to outline to inline monitoring, where these spectroscopy techniques are probably the most widely used at the moment because they can give you real-time feedback uh, but in order to make sense of the data that you get there, the pre-processing and the modeling of the data is just as important. So for the pharmaceutical industry, there will definitely be a drive going towards this as it will lead to higher yields, better overall quality and ultimately lower process costs. But unfortunately, what you will have seen, it does uh, increase operational complexity, which is why we start to train our graduates uh, in multivariate analysis, use of big data, uh, and particularly in bioprocessing. Um, so there needs to be like a certain expertise in order to achieve this, and this is not that easy. But in the future, we'll see more and more of these uh, principles, which should lead to an overall better quality control within that industry. So if you liked watching this and you haven't seen the video on QBD yet, and do have a look at this, you will see how this aligns uh, and within the playlist um, and why we have different types of bioreactors, you can also see how this is applied in practice. Thanks for watching.